Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, the AGM launching webinar of our free publication uh, of the AGM brochure. Yes. So I but would like to. I, I would I, like you. Sorry, can, can you boot yourself, please? If you let me talk, I will. <laughs> I will start the program. Thank you very much. So now. Just shortly. Uh, uh, please uh, have your microphone muted unless you're speaking and keep your camera off and use your headsets if possible. Uh, if you want to send some comments, please use the chat function in the Microsoft Teams on the top uh, right area. And please be aware that the meeting is being recorded for purpose of publishing in EPMA YouTube channel. Uh, before we start, I would like to mention about uh, the antitrust rules. Uh, please be aware that EPMA events are ruled according to antitrust guidelines, that is, According to the competition laws in EU, uh, we are not allowed to discuss in fact or in appearance or exchange information, including the prices, production and market procedures. OK, today's agenda, uh, we will be um, introducing our brochure. And um, as you can see, we will start with some chapters of the book, starting by uh, our the, the, the entire presentation will be done with our stream committee. Before that, I would like to thank everyone who contributed uh, the, in the preparation of this brochure. That is our stream committee, uh, Stephen Mosley, Brian Robach, Louis Lanes, and Susan Norgren, and also especially Dr. Jose Garcia from Sandvik, who made a lot of contribution in the preparation of the booklet. So now let's uh, go on without spending too much time. Uh, I hope you are over there, uh, uh, Stephen. Yes, here I am. OK, thank you and good morning to everybody. I see there are over 50 people in, included in this call, so that's very nice to see you all here <laughs> for the launch of this brochure. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Kenan for, for compiling this brochure. Um, uh, he, he had a steep learning curve uh, coming into the European Hard Materials Group uh, just a couple of years ago, and uh, he's done a, a great job in this. This, as you see, is the first edition. Uh, there is a second edition already um, being compiled and is ready to publish soon. So as soon as the, uh, the stress of the world PM, you saw the advert, so mark it in your diaries. As soon as the stress of the world PM uh, for marketing and uh, publishing people is over, then we will get a, an updated version of this as well. So even before I tell you what's in this one, I can give you a little teaser that there is going to be a, an updated version coming soon. So in this section, when I'm going to talk about the microstructure of, and uh, the cemented carvers themselves, uh, I would again like to thank Jose Garcia and um, the co-authors of particularly of the open access um, cemented carbide microstructures review paper, which uh, contributes a lot to this. It's uh, it won the um, uh, the award, the uh, the plenary award, uh, sorry, the uh, keynote paper award a couple of years ago at the EPMA conference. And, and, and I said at the time it's going to be one of the most referenced papers uh, in the hard materials and uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, you'll see with this as well, people will go to uh, that paper as well. But for this introduction, um, the microstructures of the cemented carbides and the focus of this is cemented carbides are, are varied. Uh, you see that in the graph here as an example on the introduction, it's one of a number of hard materials uh, that are available going from diamond, where um, around about 3000 tons or 15 billion carats are produced every year, to the cemented carbides where about 60,000 tons are produced. And this brochure does focus on, on the cemented carbides. And of course, with these materials, by changing the, the binder content, the metallic content and the hard phase content, the relative size of these hard phases and the composition of these hard phases, we can address a whole range of properties uh, and a whole range of applications. And, and this paper um, shows us, uh, sorry, this uh, brochure uh, shows us a lot of the, uh, the applications which we'll see at the end. And the microstructures of these materials, um, they're around 
20 different types, if you like, of microstructures, which you'll see when you download the brochure. Uh, it allows this material to be tailored um, to very specific uh, properties, very mechanical, physical, thermal, electrical, and so on for, for applications, including corrosion resistance. We hear a little bit about the binder later on. So these, these materials can be uh, tailored, and this um, brochure will introduce, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this class of materials and this family of materials, um, what you can actually do with the uh, these hard cemented carbides and derivatives of them. So it's a it's a nice um, overview, and I think uh, for for those of you, as I say, who are relatively new to the hard materials, it's certainly a very good starting point uh, for you to learn about uh, this this class of materials. And with that, I think uh, I'll I'll pass on to uh, to Brian to talk a little bit about the binders uh, and the standards, because I think it's important that we get to, the, to some of the case studies that are included in this booklet later on. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so we will go on in investigating more our booklet. I think uh, we can start with some discussions about the binders as uh, uh, Stephen uh, mentioned, and here we have one of the greatest experts of this area. Hello, Brian, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Kieran, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. So uh, we would be pleased if you can say us a few words about the role of binder, alternative binders, etc., as we shared in the brochure, the publication. Thank you. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, trust you're all well after the Christmas and the New Year break. Unfortunately for me, I came in this morning to find an email from a colleague saying they got COVID yesterday. Uh, and this is the first time anybody at NPL, as far as I know, has uh, got COVID in the whole of the two years. So uh, as soon as this webinar is finished, I think I'll have to go home and uh, take a test to, <laughs> to see where I am. But there you are. That's life at the moment. So I'm going to say a few words about the binder phase and uh, not too specific, but just some generalities, I think, uh, really. Uh, and then finally say a few words about uh, standards. And clearly for um, uh, hard metals, the primary one for the binder phase is to enhance the toughness of the material. We know pure tungsten carbide is reasonably tough as transition metal carbides go. Uh, but the binder adds to this toughness by absorbing energy when the material is subjected to stresses. The more binder we add, the tougher it gets. But there are other effects which I think are worth noting. Uh, for example, firstly, uh, we can use the binder phase to tailor the thermal properties. And we can do this by, by changing the volume fraction, the chemistry, or the size. And size is important. Uh, because in terms of thermal properties, interfaces are very important. And clearly, um, the smaller the size of the binder phase, the more interfaces we have. And that is a, a significant effect on the thermal properties. Secondly, by altering the chemistry, that is by adding uh, other transition metals than, car than cobalt, the binder can significantly affect the corrosion properties and other forms of degradation too. Thirdly, we can manipulate density. Uh, this can be useful in situations when stresses and, and mass are a factor. Fourthly, we can alter the stiffness of the material, dependent on the volume fraction and stiffness of the binder. This is important in how stresses develop in components and tools. Fifthly, there is the issue of health and safety in manufacture of the tools. And uh, we need to be careful that we don't make this more difficult than it is at present. So all in all, I think we have a huge experimental space that we can make use of. Uh, and there's no doubt there will be increasingly uh, a wider spectrum of binders being used, especially in these days where there's a rapidly increasing competition from materials technologies such as aerospace, clean energy, uh, vehicles. All those are going to require lots of cobalt. But I think the increased emphasis on new binders will also help us make the best use of what we already have by benchmarking products scientifically uh, and normalizing products financially to get the best for the least cost. 
So the more we know about the properties across a range of alternative binders, the better the choices we can make to minimise costs and contribute to minimising uh, climate impact. So, sorry that I haven't gone through a list of uh, the specific alternative uh, binders that we might use or that have been used at, at the moment, but I think that's something else for uh, another um, webinar. I think it needs uh, uh, a bit more work, really. So next about standards. <clears throat> Generally, uh, I think in Europe, we look towards ISO and ASTM for standards relevant to hard metals. I'm aware that there are Asian standards, China and Japan, uh, but I'm not so familiar with those. Uh, but if the community thinks it would be good to, uh, to look at them, I think that's something we could we could take on board. ISO has about 30 standards, uh, half of those addressing physical properties and half addressing uh, chemical analyses. And ASTM has about 15. Uh, and many of those are quite similar to those that we use in ISO, for example, abrasion, toughness, coercivity, bend testing. <coughs> As well as these standards in Europe, MPL and other organisations over the years have contributed many studies and reports that un underpin the uncertainties involved in the standard tests. I think one of the questions for the uh, European Hard Materials Group is whether it might be useful to compile a list for our use of these additional paper, important papers and, uh, and reports. Also, uh, <clears throat> coming uh, at the, this point in time is probably a good time to ask what next in terms of standards? Should we be considering ISO versions of the ASTM standards that we don't have or should we be looking at totally new ones? And I think you've got to bear in mind also that ISO has a review date, it's embedded in existing documents anyway. So I think it's, uh, it raises a few questions that uh, we as the uh, EH, EHMG group should reflect on and, uh, <clears throat> and look to the future. So I think, like Steve said, I hope you find the, the booklet very helpful. Uh, I must say, I particularly enjoyed looking through all the case studies at the end. It was very useful for educating funding bodies and uh, colleagues at MPL. Thank okay, you very much. I think that's, uh, if there's some questions at the end, we'll, we'll take them then. Yeah, of course, if you have some time in the end, we, we can try to answer some questions coming from our audience. Thank you very much once again. I would like now to go on our third presenter. This is Professor Luis Lanes. And now we are changing the subject a little bit. We will talk about a little bit about the processing steps of hard materials. And we start by Luis. Hello, Luis. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, Ken. Um, um, good morning to everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like also to acknowledge uh, the work in, in, in trying to coordinate it, uh, these, uh, this interesting brochure that I feel that has a very clear objective that is uh, uh, putting a basic information, but uh, maybe sometimes even a little bit deeper than basic, in a nice uh, brochure with images and, and, and concepts. Uh, in the part that uh, I have to review at least or to introduce, it refers to uh, actually in some big chapter of processing steps. Um, we are going to be doing that uh, together with uh, Susan afterwards with uh, other stages. But in the in my case, um, I would like first to, to to highlight a very nice image that we have it uh, in the introduction of this chapter, where it's clear how um, all the stages that we have it in these I would say powder metallurgy route that we conventionally used uh, for uh, producing or manufacturing cement carbides, tools, and components. Uh, besides indicating how complex or how sequential is all of this process, it's interesting uh, to highlight the idea that all these manufacturing steps are linked. And therefore, we have to be very careful uh, through all of them because little changes in one or another place might be having an important consequence for 
properties, microstructure, and of course, what is more important for people in practice, the performance of the tools and the components. Uh, in this, uh, in the particular case that I, um, I, I was uh, recalled to revise or, or to introduce, that refers mainly to the topics of uh, powder production, uh, and mixing and milling of powders and mix, milling and granulation. You see, I, I would like to do a kind of a signal that uh, when you want to have a very good meal, uh, it's important to have a good recipe. So that is important. But of course, it's very, very, very clear, very important to have amazing and uh, outstanding ingredients. So when you try to think about raw powder production, mixing and milling and spray drying of, uh, to produce the powders, actually, we are doing that. We are trying to get together the best ingredients for the recipe that we have it and trying to put all together so that at the end, we may have uh, an excellent meal. In that sense, uh, in these uh, uh, subsections, I would say 3.1 and 3.2, that refers to this powder production and mixing and milling, is clearly indicated that these factors are very, very important to, to take care uh, because at the end, they are going to define some properties or param some parameters that are defining the properties that Brian was commenting before. So when we are talking about the mean value and distribution of grain size or stechymetric of the, of the phases, uh, all that actually start being controlling uh, from the, those first stages of uh, powder production and mixing and milling. Even when you're doing the mixing uh, and milling, you're also warranting the uniformity and the, and the, and the microstructural distribution. And that is very, very important for uh, these uh, semantic carbides because we, we, we need to think that they are nice uh, materials that we use because they are hard, but at the same time, they are uh, brittle like. So sometimes to have a, a very small uh, heterogeneity or in some place, in microstructure in a place, might uh, imply a very uh, a real effect in terms of uh, performance. Uh, there are some indications through the booklet. I mean, it doesn't go to detail, but of course, it's, it's based on, 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 I would say, interesting sources. Um, in that sense, uh, before uh, I pass uh, uh, to, to Susan, uh, I would like to, to, when I look into the reference of the, of, the, of the brochure, it's interesting to see a few names that somehow has always been uh, involved in, in this very, I would say, academic uh, task of trying to revise and review uh, information in semantic archives through many years. I mean, we see that the names of Ken Brooks and I would like to acknowledge the work that Ken Brooks has been doing for many, many decades. Now he's not with us, but he has was always been in the first row of all European and World PM conferences and events. Uh, it's important to see uh, uh, the the name, of course, of Hussein Brian. Brian, we have here before, and also in a very in a joint paper with Leo Prakash. That actually one of the special acknowledgement for this uh, brochure, and that there was besides the intrinsic, it was from Leo. So actually all these actions that we are doing on the, the trademark of EPMA, but actually I would say from the tra trademark of hard materials, are somehow dedicated to people like Leo and, um, and Ken Brooks. Uh, when I mention Brian, I mention also the people of MPL, that usually they have done very interesting reviews in the in open access review that they have it, that we all have been usually can come often review it uh, and check it out for having information on the standards. We see also the name of uh, Binot Sarin, I will say there, because Sarin has been some kind of the heart and the core of the International Conference of Science of Hard Materials for many, many years. So that's also kind of events that has been good for rewind or having reviews. And finally, um, um, but no, the last but not least, I would like to acknowledge a lot the work that is doing people like uh, Jose Garcia, that actually he has been uh, the two of the papers that uh, he uh, has uh, written our main sources for this brochure. And actually, if we will have the chance, and maybe for a next a future edition, I will say that we need to include a new one that he has published in International Art of Action and Metal Hard Materials. That he has a very amazing comprehensive data collection of hardness and fractured toughness from indentation. I feel that the work that Jose and colleagues are doing on, on trying to put together all that data is an amazing source for the information that we can compile and show in this brochure. 
So uh, uh, thank you very much to all of them, and thank you very much for the community. And I feel it's good to remind all these names because uh, they had they they had they, are, they have been sometimes making life easier to all of us. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Luis, for this nice presentation. Uh, and our last um, part in, in, in here is the processing steps for rather pressing sintering coating. Again, we have one of our uh, members in our Euro AGM steering committee uh, and one of the important people who contributed in preparation of this brochure. This is Professor Susan Norgren. So Susan, are you able to hear me and talk? Yes, thank you, Kenan. Yeah, the floor um, is yours. First, first of all, I just would like to say uh, good morning and uh, and thank you all for attending this meeting. I would also like to join Luis in thanking all the contributors uh, through the years. And uh, I would like to add your name as well, Luis, to that list. Uh, when we come to the booklet, I think that uh, when we come to the pressing and sintering steps, as uh, I think Stephen mentioned in the beginning, this is for like an introductory for those who are um, new to semantic carbides and hard metals. And uh, in the booklet, it's mainly the process of uniaxial pressing that is described, but it could be good to know that there is also other ways of forming. And as you all know today, also the upcoming 3D printing of hard metals. Um, but this is like an introduction to the forming uh, and, and to hard metals in general. Um, as Louise mentioned, it's very important from the application point of view to the, have the right dimensions of your cemented carbide part. And the most important step in the controlling the dimensions is the pressing in combination with the sintering. During the sintering step, we have a debinding process during the sintering cycle. And then after the debinding, you reduce the tungsten oxides and the cobalt starts spreading across the tungsten carbide surfaces. Uh, after that, coming up to the liquid, the cobalt starts to melt and consolidates uh, the final semantic carbide. And to be able to control these two different steps during the production route is very important uh, for the final dimensions and properties of the material. Then, as uh, uh, as Louise mentioned, this, the, none of the production steps are isolated, so they are all in a chain of events. So uh, you, you took the, uh, the parallel to a good meal, Louise, and then I would also like to say it's good, it's also important to have a good chef, I think. <laughs> Um, further in the booklet, you can also read about the coating. These are mainly used in meta cutting. They are the two main, the most common um, uh, types of coatings for the cemented carbide. One is the physical vapor deposition, which is usually used on sharp edges, for instance. And then you have the chemical vapor deposition, which is the working horse when it comes to coating, for instance, in the turning, uh, steel turning and milling. Uh, when uh, you uh, combine the coating to the cemented carbide also, of course, the properties of the interface is very important and that the coating has a good adhesion to the underlying um, cemented carbide. So, um, well, uh, we hope that this booklet can be a good start for the one uh, that is a beginner in cemented carbides. And also, I would like to, to end with telling that, uh, as Stephen said, there is also a second version uh, planned and that will be released in the future. Um, with this, I would like to say thank you and uh, hand over to, to you, Kenan, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, yeah, that was the end of the part where we, dist uh, where we uh, um, present the, the, the brochure, let's say, the booklets. Uh, and now we are passing to a, a, another um, uh, step where we will be um, um, presenting the case studies that took part in the brochure. This is a very important area of the 
publication. And for this, I would like to uh, thank to these companies and people who will be presenting here now. Uh, uh, Elena Tares Puit from uh, Hyperion, and uh, Dr. Jose Garcia from Sandvik Coromant, uh, Michael Dreschel from Ceratizit, and I don't know if he is here, but Manfred Wolf from Kenametal, and you, as you have already met, Stephen Mosley from Hilti and Susan Norgren from Sandvik. Now, uh, let me um, share my uh, second presentation where we uh, where we go on with the case studies, I guess. Yeah. I hope you see it. Yeah, it looks like OK, and I hope Elena is here. Elena, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you, Kenan. OK, you have uh, four different um, cases that you shared with us. So as uh, you say, go on to the next one. I will just be clicking on the button. So the floor is yours. OK, <laughs> perfect. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, Canon and to the EPMA for the opportunity to be part of this excellent initiative and be able to present here today as a guest speaker. Hyperion Materials and Technology employs more than 1,700 people around the world. Our headquarters is in the United States, but we have production and research facilities in all regions and sales in more than 70 countries. We offer an extensive portfolio of hard and super hard materials, and we have decades of experience developing and manufacturing cemented carbide powders, sintered cemented carbides, synthetic diamonds, and cubic boron nitrates. Our customers span a wide range of markets and industries. They create drill bits, cut diapers, polish optical materials, draw wires, manufacture cans, cut metal, and so much more. Today, we will see four selected cases that provide examples of our wide range of our expertise and products. We will start with our cemented carbide stamping tool blanks. Stamping is a technology used to manufacture a wide range of metallic parts, for instance, connectors and lead frames, among many others. Hyperion produces cemented carbide stamping tool blanks in the range of sizes and dimensions needed to create this wide array of metallic parts. In addition to this, stamping different metallic materials also demands different tool material properties. Hyperion has developed and manufactures a comprehensive cemented carbide grade offering that allows us to customize the grid selection depending on the application. This grid offering covers different tanks and carbide grain sizes, binder components, binder chemical nature, presence of gamma phase, etc. If none of the existing grades is considered suitable, Hyperion R&D staff can develop a tailored grade to fit a specific application. Our purpose is always to position our customer to win. So we will work closely with them to ensure improved wear resistance and optimize performance and reliability, and to enable high speed stamping rate. Next slide, please, Canon. This case study corresponds to our cemented carbide solution for manufacturing two pieces beverage cans via drawing and ironing of aluminum or steel caps that are fed into the body maker. Great DZ18 is our premium cemented carbide solution. It is characterized by a fine grain size and by the presence of not only tungsten carbide, but also other precipitated carbides, the ones that are called cubic or gamma phase. The presence of such cubic phase in DZ18 lowers the material density by up to 15%. An equally important, no detrimental effect on wear resistance is observed in the application when compared, of course, to standard cemented carbides. These, of course, translate into punches for manufacturing cans that are 15% lighter. 
Such density and weight reduction are highly important when we consider the can manufacturing process where the body maker ram strokes between 210 and 450 strokes per minute and up to a length of 0.7 meters, depending on can geometry. The use of a lighter cementic carbide punch leads to a reduced body maker ram drop and to an improved tool pack alignment. As a consequence, the tier of rate or can breakage rate is reduced and the punch maintains its integrity for longer, exhibiting a production life three times higher than those of conventional carbide grades. Can I next slide, please? During the wire drawing process, many steps are needed. At the beginning of the drawing line, or dry wire drawing, drawing speeds are slower, wire diameter reduction is high for each step, and the material used for the drawing nibs is required to exhibit high fracture toughness. On the other hand, towards the end of the drawing line, or wet wire drawing, drawing speeds are faster, wire diameter reduction is low for each step, and the material used for the drawing nib is required to exhibit high hardness, thermal conductivity, and wear resistance. To meet those requirements, Hyperion developed a proprietary semantic carbide grade, 6UD+, for wet wire drawing of ultra-high tensile strength steels for tire core reinforcement. 6UD+, is characterized by a 6% weight binder content and ultra-fine grain size. The unique 6UD plus material design leads to a high hardness, up to 2050 Vickers hardness, as well as to increase thermal conductivity and corrosion resistance. The combination of all these properties translates into an excellent wear resistance when compared to a standard carbide grades historically used in this field. These targeted semantic carbide properties positions 6UD plus as a new benchmark in wire drawing for tire cord applications. Next slide, please, Kenna. <clears throat> in this final Hyperion case study, we are presented semantic carbide rotary cutters to manufacture FFP2 face masks. A rotary cutter is a cutting tool placed in a cutting unit that cuts non-woven materials such as those used in the hygiene and personal care industries, among others. As we have seen in the Stample Tool Blanks case study, two of our strengths are production flexibility and working closely with our customers to provide tailored-made solutions. By combining these strengths, with our long history and expertise in the rotary cutter business, we were able to quickly develop, in a moment of high uncertainty and high market demand, a custom solution for a customer that manufactures FFP2 face masks. The global pandemic created the need for a cutting solution that is a step above the steel and other materials traditionally used to cut face masks. Hyperion semantic carbide rotary cutters provide the high wear resistance and toughness needed to create the longer cutting tool life, better reliability and durability required to meet the pandemic needs. With this, thank you for your attention today and thank you Canon and the PMA for the time today. Should anybody have any question, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much. Uh, our next um, is, um, contributor for the case studies is Sandvi Coromant, and we have uh, Dr. Jose Garcia here. As I mentioned in the uh, beginning, uh, two papers of uh, Mr. Garcia forms the backbone of our publication. So, Jose, are you able to talk? And can you hear me? Uh Yes, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, we have uh, one single but very nice uh, case study from Sandvik 
Coromand. Uh, you can say some words about it and also some say some words about the work we have done for the publication. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, thank you very much for, for the invitation today. Uh, I think I really think this brochure is a, a really good idea and also it's a very nice conception. And I think all the contributors and especially you, Kenna, has done a great work compiling all this information. So I think it's uh, it will be a very useful tool for, for, for the future. Um, I think I might can share also some of the comments before uh, and, and also about our contributions in uh, the, the review papers we have done. Actually, we, we are aiming at creating a common view in the in the hard metal community and, and, and the reason of compiling the microstructures and now <clears throat> collecting data on, on harness toughness and, 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 and be giving this to, to the communities for, for the aim of of creating a common view and sharing this uh, this information, and it's interesting when when we when we think about Brian comments on on on, on norms, for example, when 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 we did now the compilation of the harness and toughness uh, data that can be also complementary to to the microstructures, we saw that <clears throat> because uh, people or our community is not using the same ways of measuring and don't mention norms usually. If you collect the data, almost 40% of the data is not, not use, use, useful because it, you, there is no way to track how it, it has been done. So putting a norm together <clears throat> uh, in the community and, and, uh, and letting the people use the norm in the proper way would be very useful for, for the future. Um, so just a simple comment here and now, now this example, uh, uh, I think it's uh, one of the yeah, clear examples where microstructure is playing a role in the, the semantic microstructure playing a role in the, in, in the application and I think connecting also to what we mentioned before. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons uh, we use these grains synthetic carbides because uh, usually in semantic carbides we, we need to combine harness and toughness and, uh, and usually uh, in some in applications we need more toughness than, than the material can give us. And for this, we are creating this kind of grain structure where we locally are changing the, the properties of, of the cemented carbide. And, <clears throat> and this is a very fascinating uh, uh, microstructure because the, the gradient, the modification of the, of the microstructure locally in the, in the cemented carbide is produced by diffusion in, in, a, in a diffusion control process in sintering. So we are creating this type of microstructure <clears throat> by making a proper selection of, of powder of sintering process and and, and also <clears throat> on on how, how to play around the different components uh, to, to to create this uh, this modified surface that you see in, the, in this uh, particular case and then of course I mean uh, as I was mentioned also in the presentation uh, we we usually are coating these carbides and and usually in this case, is the chemical vapor deposition, the, the multi-layer providing the, the needed properties in the machine. So the combination of the carbide and the coating is, is giving these uh, unique properties. Uh, and you see here these colors actually are not painted, it's not powder, it's, it's just that the different phases uh, when we are making a carbon nitride or aluminum oxide, they will have different colors and we can create this kind of fancy structures. And, eventually change also the color to more attractive ones. So I would say it's a nice example of a, a very complex microstructure and semantic carbide and also a, the combination uh, with the coating to achieve certain properties. And, and you know that in this type of machining and especially turning in, in steel is probably one of the most widespread applications and, and largest volume of carbide uh, we are producing uh, uh, basically in uh, Sambic uh, Corma. So I think that is uh, my few words to this. Uh, thank you again very much, Kenan, and all the group uh, for, for the nice words also, and also for, for this work. And looking forward to the version number two. Uh, for this You're work. welcome, Jose. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so now I will go on to our next uh, contributor for our case studies. This is Seratizit. And we have several um, cases from Seratizit. Dr. Mihail Drushel will be presenting. So, Mihail, are you able to hear me? Yes. And talk, maybe? I also hope you hear me well, everyone. 
Uh, Mihal, we hear you very deep. Uh, yeah. I hope it's now a little bit better. Now it's better, yes. Ah, now okay, so I keep the microphone a bit closer to the mouse. So good morning That's to everybody. And I'm very proud to uh, share and present these four case studies in the next minutes from Sarah Desit. As you know, we are one of the uh, uh, early uh, pioneers in this uh, cemented carbide business as we had last year our century of experience university, uh, university uh, together with the plant group. And uh, following up the, the previous uh, words and speakers, I would like to introduce you to some examples. Uh, for example, these valve plates for diesel fuel systems, which is a nice example of, of a optimized binder system in combination with mechanical properties, what cemented carbide is able to do. The need in that case is for fuel injection system at heavy duty diesels that you have to have a wide, high, very resistant material, which has to be very accurate and precise. And on the other hand, in the harsh condition of these fuels has to be extreme corrosion resistance. And nevertheless, there are still some other impacts like cavity and uh, the demand of the users that the engines should run all the times and downtime are not really very well. Due to this, uh, we have developed this material and these parts together with our customers that they can run smoothly the engines, even with the worst condition of the fuels used. And that is really a nice example of a corrosion resistant material, which has all the properties needed also in the geometrical capabilities and the other mechanical properties. Uh, Canon, if you would like to switch over to the next slide, please. As also previously mentioned, the typical cemented carbide is a powder metallurgical one, and in the last years, the improvements in 3D printing or AM manufacturing were really amazing. So we also started to keep that in uh, the focus, and then our Luxembourg plant. We are here working on the AM printing of cemented carbides in different technologies and grades. And uh, as you see on the picture, this is uh, one part uh, as a segment that uh, is uh, cut, which is made by additive manufacturing cemented carbide grade. And you see that these inside shapes, hollow structures are really fancy. So we opened the mind of our designers here and gave them the freedom to design whatever they wanted to get an inside structure who is so fancy. And the trick is that this technology allows us now to create these structures also in real life. Uh, yes, also similar parts were done with conventional powder metallurgy processes, but uh, the inside structures are limited to certain uh, capabilities and uh, functionalities and we found out that the AM is now a real new technology to uh, create new capabilities in design and functionality also in cemented carbide. And that is something which we offer to our customers that we have on the one hand the cemented carbide properties and on the other hand the expanded geometrical possibilities which gives the designers and the applications of our customers completely new perspective. And uh, currently we are in the phase of prototyping and little pre-series, but nevertheless, this is very promising and a real new step in the car industry after the last 100 years. If you would like, please to switch to the next grade slide, please. Yes, that is an example where cemented carbide is uh, winning in application due to his rigidity. And on the other hand, um, ultrasonic application is here also the, the special topic. These ultrasonic knives are used to cut composite materials like honeycomb structures uh, as they are used in aerospace and automotive. And uh, the systems on the market, like braced steel carbide knives or carbide knives, 
uh, had certain limitations, especially in the ultrasonic application and uh, transfer of the energy, and especially in the rigidity, which at the end defines a very uh, well needed uh, precision of the final cut parts. So we developed there a special cemented carbide grade and the complete design of a monolith cemented carbide part, which now responds much better in the ultrasonic vibration and leads to extremely good quality and uh, reliability for the customers in regards to the cut products they get out of it. And last not least, the next slide please. Yes, we also work in the rotary cutters as uh, the Hyperion uh, colleagues, which are also made in cemented carbide and we are providing the blanks to our customers, especially in the big size ranges. Uh, we are in the capacity and capabilities in our, our production plants able to supply these huge parts who are needed in hygienic packaging and food industries. And we were also very proud that we could supply solutions to our customers in the pandemic times that they also could use this medical mask and FFP2 mask as mentioned before. Here very important is that you have on the one side the extreme great size of the part and on the other hand you are still in a near net shape fabrication in these XXL size parts with the precision of these cutting edges who have to be ground afterwards. With these materials and grades uh, long lifetimes are observed and that is very good to reduce the total cost of ownership and for your info these 100 million cut in operations is a minimum value requirement for one regrinding or grinding step and as you can imagine there are many 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 parts produ produced with such part. So what is our unique set? point is there and what we also want to focus out is the dimensional capability of cemented carbide parts and this is combined with the excellent process reliability and the material properties in excellence of cemented carbides. Thank you for listening and if you want to have further infos you can contact us for sure via Canon if you don't have our address or my address personally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. This was a really nice sample, especially the last one. I never, I've never seen such a big <laughs> carbide part in my life. <laughs> yes, we are specialized on these sizes. Uh, okay, it's really a huge, huge toy. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank so you. Uh, now um, I want to switch to our uh, next um, um, case study suppliers. This is Canon Metal, but un unfortunately I don't have Manfred here. Is there anyone from Canon Metal? If not, I will be saying some few words about their samples very quickly. So you can find all these samples, the case studies in the publication. And by the way, I forgot to mention also, the publication is available for a download on EPMA uh, website from the free, uh, free publications area. You can freely download the brochure as PDF. Uh, so the first one is centrifuge tiles made of carbide and steel. They are rather small parts, but as I understand, they are really uh, good in abrasive wear resistance and corrosion resistant uh, samples. The second one is um, embedded tungsten carbide uh, uh, hard material uh, into, uh, into a big body with some copper alloys. And this is a drill bit, a matrix PCD drill bit. And uh, as you can see in the benefits, it's a kind of near sh net shape and high volume production uh, process tool uh, useful for uh, drilling. Another one is a water jet nozzle. Uh, as far as I know, I'm not an expert, but the pressure on the top the tip of this tool is very high. This means a high uh, wear and corrosion maybe. So as you can see, this is a very superior wear resistance. Uh, although the water pressure on the edge is extremely high. 
no, uh, I think that's the last one yet. Yeah. Now I want to go to uh, uh, Sandwick, uh, where uh, I would like to invite once again um, Susan, Professor Susan Norgren, to present the two samples from Sandvik. Susan, are you available? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much, Kenan. And this presentation then will be from Sandvik Mining. So now we're walking into the mining business and uh, here you can see uh, cemented carbides for mining are usually coarse grained and has a lower cobalt content compared to to other applications. And in this uh, first, we give the example of, of, the, uh, of a straight grade, which is the main workhorse when it comes to underground drilling and colouring. And this is a new grade that's been released by called Power Carbide from the Sandvik uh, Mining Group. And it's um, used mainly in top hammer drilling, where the hammer uh, with the impact for the hammer is traveling through the drill string to the bit. Um, the other uh, grade that you will see here to the right, uh, it's actually, it's called the dual property or the DP grade, where Sambic Mining has two different DP grades. Uh, you heard uh, José Garcia mention gradients in meta cutting before, and those gradients are typically 25 microns. If we look at the gradients in these materials, they are in the size of millimeters. So the core of this uh, carbide is uh, actually containing etaphase, uh, and thanks to carbide and binder and the outermost part of the rock drill button is uh, containing only tungsten carbide and cobalt. This uh, uh, rock drilling grade is mainly used in the down the hole application where the hammer is very close to the bit, so the impact of the hammer on the carbide uh, is, is much more severe and then you need this um, uh, specially designed carbide to take the loads from the impact. Uh, both of these grades uh, belong to something called the, the Sambic uh, Power Carbide and you can google that and you could see all uh, the different grades. I think I will, I don't know Canon, will the next ones come right after? Yes, yes it is <laughs> so there are two more grades in this family. And the, what the, the top one is, is called the gradient cemented carbide because it is a gradient cemented carbide. In this case, it's a dual phase material from the core to the outer part in comparison to the dual property we had earlier. In this case, it is uh, in the two phase region of tungsten carbide and cobalt from the top and inwards. And you can see the hardness profile there, where you see it's really hard at the top, the operating part of, of the rock drill button, and then it becomes tougher and tougher. And thus, thus, of course, as it wears down, it will stop cracks from propagating, since the material will have more and more binder as you wear it down. Uh, the other one that is to the to the right uh, is the harness profile of that. That grade is specially made for work hardening, and in this case, as the, the more you hit, the harder you um, exposure you uh, put it out to, the harder it the response will be. Um, so it becomes both harder and more wear resistance as the drilling progresses. The top one, I should mention also again, the, the CG81. It's extremely good in conditions with a lot of quartz in the rock because it has a very low fraction of binder in the outer part of, of, the, of the button. And both these applications, this uh, you see in this, are used in both the top hammer application and in the down the hole drilling and also in the rotary drilling applications. And rotary drilling in the mining is without the percussions. And if you are more interested in this uh, and would like to know more, please uh, contact either me directly or Canon and we'll guide you to, uh, to, to the right contacts. 
Um, with this, I would like to hand over Kenan to the next. Thank you. Thank you, you, Susan. Thank you very much. Our uh, last um, case study supplier or contributor is Hilti. And again, I would like to invite uh, Stephen Mosley to present uh, the case. We have several cases from Hilti, yes, but we are sir. running out of time. Maybe you can uh, select a few of them to present I'll and then we let some time for some questions. Stephen, what do you think? I'll select two. If you go to the slide um, four, uh, the fourth one, the SDS uh, drill bits, slotted drive shaft or slotted drive system uh, hammer drill bits. Uh, this is a similar application to, to what we heard in the mining, but of course uh, in handheld tools, not in not in large um, down the hole tools or, or top hammer tools. These are between five and 55 millimeters. The important thing I want to mention here is the fact that it's not just the carbide, but it's the, the steel, the helix, the geometry. The joining technology is also very important. In most cases, we are using carbide that has to be joined to something else. Now, whether it's brazing, um, or resistance welding as, as two examples here, it's extremely important that the joining technology can also cope with the high stresses that the, um, that the actual cemented carbide has to uh, endure. And in this case, uh, we are using between 10 and 16 volume percent of the, of the binder, typically um, a cobalt uh, grade, so uh, six to 10 weight percent with a grain size of about one to three microns, depending on the tool, the uh, the type of concrete, the uh, the size of the drill bit, the joining technology, and so on. So we have great flexibility uh, within um, the choice of materials, uh, but it's important also not to forget the manufacturing of the actual uh, drill bit body itself. If you go back one slide to the saw blades, I'd like to mention one other thing where um, sawing, handheld sawing on construction sites is also extremely important. And these so-called tungsten carbide tip blades um, are using much more complicated um, cemented carbides uh, generally uh, and the so-called cermets. So there are cases, for example, the linear saw blades, the so-called reciprocating saw blades are typically resistance welded straight tungsten carbide cobalt grades, let's say uh, 8 to uh, 15 or roughly 12 to 22, 23 volume percent of, of cobalt, submicron grains typically. Uh, and they are used for cutting steels, um, non-metallic uh, materials and so on, and they are resistance welded on. Uh, the rotary uh, circular saw blades are using the complicated um, tungsten carbide cubic phase materials or even the cermets with uh, cobalt nickel binders as an example and other phases, carbon nitride phases, and they are usually brazed on uh, using uh, standard uh, silver copper uh, braces and these have to withstand of course in handheld vibrations impacts um, high temperatures and continuous cutting and they really are uh, pushing the limits of the cemented carbides uh, that uh, uh, in this application so the very interesting technologies uh, behind this is not just the cutting material it's everything else that goes with it uh, including the grinding and the coatings and so on. So it's a, it's a complete system. And that's one thing to remember with the cemented carbides and other hard materials. They are generally part of a, a larger system and we have to consider everything when we uh, select the grades uh, for these applications. So with that, um, I'll, I'll leave the other case studies based on diamond for you to read in the download. And I hope you enjoy the brochure and I hope you've enjoyed the hour that, uh, that you spent with us. And thank you for attending. Thank you very much, Stephen. Actually, uh, this is the uh, this is the end of our presentation. Uh, we are out of time, but maybe we can consider some few questions. Uh, if uh, there are any questions from the audience, we would like to answer. Uh, let's check. OK, I don't see. So we usually have good uh, congratulations. Thank you, Hank. Thank you, Jacqueline. <laughs> OK, so. Oh. If done, uh, I would like to end the meeting. Thank you very much for joining. And we hope that you like our new publication. And as Susan mentioned in the beginning, we will probably go for a second edition where we will improve the content uh, with more updates. Uh, and thank you for joining. Hope to see you in our next event of EPMA. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye.
Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.